today we're going to talk a little bit about Transolar, <coughs> what we are doing, how our view of the world and how we work, how we approach projects, and uh, hope that we can turn this into a debate, into a discussion. So whenever you have ideas, comments, uh, I would really like to have more uh, discussion than a uh, presentation of this, okay? Most of the Transola people, they already know this slide. Uh, it's just uh, making a little bit fun, but this, the, the topic is actually very serious. We still need to think about uh, carbon emissions uh, of the built environment. And as we all know, in the Western world, we know that 40 to 50% of the carbon emissions are coming from the building sector. So that puts a lot of pressure on our work. It's more than the whole traffic sector. And this is what we think where we have to make a contribution. No? Does it work? Yeah, it works. So a little bit about Transolar, you might have looked already on our website. We have four offices, our main, our headquarter, so to call it, <laughs> is here in Stuttgart. We're still a small company, but then we also have a, an office in Munich, an office in Paris since May, May, Mayish, oh. <laughs> for half a year now, and an office in New York City. So these are our four offices. We have about 55 employees, so it's still very small. Like we, were, we work in a very specific field. Our scope is very limited, so to this regard with the 50-ish people, we can actually work on a, on a broad range of projects. And I give you a, only a summary of some projects so that you have a better understanding of our work. But then coming back to this question of carbon emissions, oh, this is in German, but doesn't matter. What it shows is like the carbon emissions of the European Union, the scale you can't read either. I think it's the wrong background. But this is 1990, and this is where it's supposed to be in 2050. This is what's called the European Union Carbon Roadmap. And the idea behind this is that if you take all carbon emissions the world can deal with, and you say everybody on the planet has the same right to use carbon emissions, and they distribute it evenly, then in the European Union, we have to get to here. So it's a, it, has, it has some, let's say, legal and physical background. It's not just a number out of the dark. Uh, so if, and then what they did already, they looked at the various sectors and how to distribute it. And buildings are in many of these sectors. If you take the building sector, the building sector has to reduce by 90%. So what it means is that the building sector basically has to become carbon, uh, carbon neutral. Let's say considering new buildings, but also considering the whole building stock. This is what makes it very challenging. And uh, especially since we have no idea how we could potentially get there. And it's like 50 years is almost nothing. Or 40 years, less than 40 years. Uh, like there, is a, there was in one of the newspaper was uh, a statistic of how fast innovation make it into the market. And it was in the computer industry, it was a couple of weeks. In the car industry, it was a, couple, a few months, like a couple of months up to a few years. In the building industry, it was up to 50 years until innovation really makes it into a market. So now we have to renew our completely building stock within 37 years. It's basically mission impossible what we have. But that's the task, and the question is, how do we, can we get there? Now, we, what we do, I think <coughs> we do climate engineering, we call it climate engineering, but mainly we use computer modeling tools, like this is a thermal modeling tool, this is a modeling tool or thermal modeling of the underground, looking at the temperature distribution in the underground if we have geothermal systems. This is a daylight tool, this is a CFD tool, and just to give you a sense of how these tools developed over the years, this was in the mid-90s, was probably our first CFD model we ever did. It was two-dimensional <laughs> at the time. It was for the, not, uh, for the uh, LVR, Landesversicherungsanstalt. How would you translate Landesversicherungsanstalt? <laughs> <laughs> it's a public endurance, health endurance <laughs> company sitting at the north close to the coast uh, in the north of Germany. And we worked on this with Benish, basically only in this main central hall, uh, like the entrance hall, which is all glass, has an internal shade. And we did the CFD model to prove that this solar chimney here draws air 
through a ground duct, which cools the air that comes in and then cools the whole space. Uh, no mechanical ventilation, no air conditioning, no mechanical cooling, just this chimney drawing the air through the ground duct. And like this result was actually so convincing that the client bought into the idea. Even though like looking at it a couple of years later, we recognized that it's all stupid what we showed because like air would never, like naturally driven would never shoot out like this out of a ground duct. You would get a displacement ventilation. You would get more, much more, like it would move horizontally first before it heats up and then go up. So you would get a much more horizontal distribution of the fresh air. Uh, which would work even better, or let's say the building works in reality even better than what we have showed there. But at the time, something like this was so unique that everybody believed us just by the colorful image. <laughs> yeah. But the tools have advanced quite significantly. Like this is a CFD model we just did recently for Toronto, showing whether we can deal with a fully glazed facade without radiator heating or without perimeter heating in the climate of Toronto. And we distinct, or we said like 0.2 meters per second is the threshold of where it starts to become uncomfortable. So this shows the, basically this threshold line where we have higher wind speeds than 0.2 meters per second when it's minus 15 outside. So we could say up to here, if you have double glaze, beyond here, you can't have a work desk. Whereas if you triple glaze it, you can go closer to the facade. So it starts to become a really reliable design tool where you can give clear directions of what it means. And it's all three dimensional. And this is even a very simple one, but you would probably agree, huh? no? That it's became a very reliable tool. Well, but let's see what we say in 20 years time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> From what we know today. <laughs> It's actually a very reliable tool. So, okay, let's jump over this. So what we do is called, we call it climate engineering. And just to give you an idea of what climate engineering could mean, uh, we did this installation at the Venice Architecture Biennale in 2010, where we wanted to do a cloud. We did a cloud at a fair in Frankfurt a couple of years ago. It was Nadir his project, this one. The cloud before was done by Wolfgang and me. And then, so the idea of a cloud is what we has established in Frankfurt already to create these three layers. That you have a cloud, you see water particles in air. You need to have a saturated layer of air. So you need to have 100% humidity, basically, so that you can spray in water, which starts to appear as a cloud. In order to make this float, you need to have a layer with a higher density of air being below. So warm air goes up, humid air goes also up. So warm and humid air stays on top of cold and dry air. But then as soon as the saturated layer would touch the ceiling, you get condensation and the cloud is gone. So you need an even hotter layer on top with lower density to protect the cloud layer of touching the ceiling. So you squeeze it like a sandwich. And then after, like the physics is pretty simple. Like the complexity is how to create these three stable layers. And Nadir can tell you long stories about it. <laughs> I, how long does it, did it take? Probably four months, yeah, four months of testing until they really had these three stable layers of air. We are professional cloud makers, so to say. <laughs> yeah. No, it was an installation. Yeah, it was an installation. We got asked to do an installation at the Biennale, at the Architecture Biennale, and we said, if we do, it, like, we are not architects, nor are we artists, but how can we make our profession visible? And the cloud for us was the visualization of climate engineering. Like you really need to engineer the climate to make this to make this cloud appear like a real cloud appear, and then it stayed there over a period of four months, five months, isn't it? Yeah, three months. Three months. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, 
beginning. Yeah, you're right. Maybe you can just provide context of what the Biennale is, because I suspect most people outside of oh, yeah, okay. aren't familiar with that. Okay. Yeah, maybe you. I, I you don't have really nothing. Know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not from Europe. <laughs> it's a worldwide thing. It's the world show of architecture, let's put it this way. There, is, uh, <clears throat> there are old manufacturing halls, which is called the Arsenale, where every year a curator is putting, every other year, a curator is, cur is inviting friends to make installations to show the latest of the latest, basically. And then there are pavilions, country pavilions, and each country is uh, curating their own pavilion within the overall, uh, uh, within the overall topic. So that's, that's the idea. And then every, every other year is uh, Art Biennale, and then next year is again, so this year is Art Biennale, and next year again is Architecture Biennale. So every other year. And next year, Rim Kohlhaas is the curator. The important thing about it is, for us, is that it's, it's you, you can imagine it's important enough that all of the architects or all of the important architects actually go there the first two days when it opens up and it looks at these installations. So it's, it's, you cannot imagine the density of, of architects that come in and, sh and see the show, no matter if they are really famous or if they're still students or whatever. So the idea is, for us, it was, it was exciting to be there as engineers because engineers are usually not asked to be part of this. And then people actually go through this installation and see our work. I mean, there's no better way of making public what we do in uh, the, be, the architects being our major clients. Distributor of, yeah. of our work. <laughs> yeah. I think that was the whole idea. Yeah. But the idea involved to, to do sort of design strategies or design tools or something like that later on? The cloud idea? No, like the cloud here is just showing to what ex to how extremely we can manipulate the climate so that even a cloud starts to appear, but it should not, like the cloud itself is not a design intent, but it should show our abilities to play and manipulate and deal with climate. So they call it the cloud bakery. <laughs> in the meantime, we made two more clouds, isn't it? Nadia made another one in, in Tokyo, and, and now Munich made Munich. right about Munich. In a theater, on a theater stage as a kind of a stage design. Yeah, and, <laughs> it, and we did one for kids. <laughs> as a kind of a summer camp, we made a cloud camp. <laughs> how, how did you do it if you all the infiltration of that whole building to stabilize the cloud? That's something, uh, that's something we could talk another hour about. You should talk to her. You should talk to Nadir, but uh, let's say there's one thing is the infiltration, which is like all kind of turbulences you have to avoid because it immediately start to mix. When we did testing with the kids, there was a group of kids coming and three or four kids started to run around in a circle and all of a sudden they pulled the entire cloud down. <laughs> With tornado, they created a tornado. Within a minute, the cloud was gone or like let's say the cloud was everywhere. <laughs> Uh, not where it's supposed to be. So there you see how sensitive it is. And in this very sensitive environment, you have to bring in a lot of steam in the right layer so that it start, doesn't start to mix the space. So you deal with steam and hot air and cold air. And, and like, again, Nadia could give you a whole lecture on how, how, to, how to create. And, I think the point is, the bigger the space, the more complicated. Mm -hmm. In a space like this, you can make a cloud within an hour or two, mm -hmm. if you have the equipment. But this space, and in combination with this very old building, made it very complicated. And this makes it, in Munich, it makes it more also interesting because you have a stage, you have lighting, and then you have the cloud on the stage during the, the, the play, but you also have the room which leads up to people sitting there and people and there's like a, a different volume of a, of a of this big room of the theater before so they were not sure if this was going to work but it and two he just told me Stefan told me that twice they thought it was not going to work but now it 
the cloud is there and it does work. Okay. I don't know how they solved it. They will tell us. I, I, mean, I think what is interesting to take from this example is just that the, our work is about understanding heating and air flows within a building environment often and really being able to be an expert on exactly what happens within not just the overall building but within a room space and within the different air sections within and that's that when we can show that we can create a space like this that people imagine is impossible it allows us to convince architects as well that we can manage displacement ventilation for example or simple air natural ventilation so if people can do a cloud they can also do a comfortable space like <laughs> that's the message <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this was the cloud from above. Okay, this is about the cloud, and but coming back to this question of sustainability, like what makes a sustainable building, we see like worldwide now we see these checklists, and as a result of those checklists, don't want to say it's a mistake of the checklist, but as a result we often the, see these kind of buildings, like where gadgets are applied to something which is stupid to begin with. Uh, and what our philosophy is always that we have to create efficiency by the design and we have to create better environments by the design and not by applying gadgets later when it's too late. So that's the idea. Now a building doesn't need to be fast and the building doesn't need to swim like a racing boat. It has more requirements like there are urban requirements, there are many programmatic requirements. So it would be stupid to say energy efficiency is the only requirement but it contributes to one of the requirements that shape the building, that shape the design, and hopefully create spaces like this, which is a spa in Tokyo where we found it, this <laughs> advertisement in a magazine uh, where they said, welcome to breathtaking Tokyo water park. And then they said, where, where you can wash away the pressure and stress of the overcrowded city. <laughs> so this is not considered overcrowded in, in Tokyo. No, but I think what I always liked on this image is no matter how energy efficient this spa is, the energy con consumption per person is negligible. So we can't distinguish energy efficiency or sustainability from environmental quality. It's one thing, it's part of the architectural approach and it needs to be integral to the architectural approach so that we create spaces people like to go, people use, and therefore are valuable for the, for the user and the society as a whole. So coming, going back a little bit again in history, in architectural history, this is Manhattan, downtown Manhattan, Flatiron building here. What you see is that every single window has external shading. Every window is operable for natural ventilation. And like in this building, you also see that, that the floor depth is limited so that people are lined up along the facade. And this, the reason is quite simple. It's because Carrier invented the air conditioning in the 20s. So none of those buildings in 1902 had air conditioning. And so the only source for ventilation for fresh air and daylight and the breeze, basically natural cooling, was through the window. That's the only source they had. And I don't want to say, like, Manhattan can be unbearable in summer. I don't want to say it was always brilliant inside. But they knew how to make the best out of the situation, basically. And then <clears throat> what you see, like, 80 years later, this building, for instance, was built in 84. It has no operable window, no external shading. It has so much coating that it, that it barely gets daylight inside. Floor depth is super big. Most people are not even uh, close to the facade. And uh, if there is a power outage in New York, people has, have to leave this building. Like, people can still stay in the Flatiron building, like the Flatiron building providing better environmental quality and, and better energy efficiency than buildings we built 80 years later. So we see that something went completely wrong, and the question is, how can we get things together without building flat iron buildings all the time? So this is a building I'm going to show you later. This is Unilever. We worked with Benish in, ha in Hamburg, which is at the harbor in Hamburg. And we created this double facade by using these single layer ETF e-foil. Like usually, you know these ETF e-foils from these cushion structures like the Allianz Stadium in Munich or the water cube in Beijing. Here in this case, we used it as a single layer, which was the first building ever where ETFE was used as a single layer membrane. 
and created this buffer zone which provides wind protection for the external shade but it's also connected this space it's also connected to the courtyard so what it allows when they have like the the, the cruise ship terminal is a block away from this building and when these big cruise ships are sitting in in the harbor of hamburg they basically have smog conditions people can't open their window because they have no exhaust control or exhaust filtration and it's like a city of well, I'm not sure how many people are sitting on such a cruise ship so they have all these ex uh, exhibitions and people can't open their window and in order to give these people some better fresh air quality they want to open a window they still have this air connection to the courtyard and still can open the window but this is not something you can achieve with some sort of a machine which is which is sitting in the basement this is part of the architectural design. So that's why we believe that really the, the design is key. The machines are also important, but the design is key to provide better quality for the people. Uh, isn't like using the knowledge facade and the technology, isn't it like going somewhere in the spectrum, like because it's costly and it's needs a separate structure. And so the facade comes back in the spectrum, also close to a machine in a basement. And, uh, just like it's, a, it's in a way, it can become a machine. Like I show a building later, which where the double facade really became a machine, like the KFW building. Mm -hmm. This one is fairly simple. And the reason why, well, one of the, the, the reason the driver for using ETFE was money. Yeah. ETFE was much less expensive than using glass, especially within the shape the architect wanted to have. Yeah. Uh, but what was a nice and interesting side effect was that the embodied energy of CTFE is significantly lower than using a glass facade. So that the structure is less, even though it looks quite heavy here, but you need, it's, it's like you have significantly less weight and the material itself, ETFE to produce is much, requires much less energy than use it, uh, producing glass. Yeah. Um, uh, with respect to the uh, double facade, uh, it's, inter it's, it's connected between each other. And uh, from what I know is that the disadvantage of uh, connecting the double facade is uh, for the noise impact and the uh, fire. Uh, it's problematic, problematic, you mean? May uh, maybe. Is it problematic or not? You always have, like, I think through the year, I think we all discuss all the issues of double facades, all the pros and cons. There is a problem that you get noise transfer, like if two people have their windows open, that you get a noise transfer going through the double facade from one space to the other space. And also between the floors. Uh, this is like something you get as a byproduct. You also have the issue that if smoke enters, uh, it creates a chimney for the smoke, and if the floor above has the window open, you, the smoke re-enters the space. Mm -hmm. So these are all, let's say, issues you need to deal with. But there is, no, there is no answer like this is the solution. ETFE makes it much easier because ETFE just disappears in case of fire. Mm -hmm. And it's even acoustically also. If this is what we're producing. Yeah. yeah. And acoustically, it's also easier to deal with. But on the other hand, like the goal would certainly be always to build buildings where the passive systems are optimized to the extent where you don't need a mechanical system. This would be the ideal. None of those buildings I show you ever achieved the ideal. So this has a mechanical ventilation system inside. So if people don't, if people are, if, if they want to have a secret discussion with somebody, they have to close the window. I think that's the easiest solution to it. <laughs> I think things become more difficult, but also more interesting when you suddenly rely on passive systems, when the only source for fresh air is the operable window, like here, then all of a sudden you have to kind of deal with the noise. Like we had a meeting in this small room with five, six people, and the, somebody was uh, blowing away, how do you say, laubbläser. <laughs> <laughs> the leaves away. And like it was so noisy, we couldn't keep the window open, so therefore you have the choice between bad air or noise, like you can't have both. <laughs> that's, the, yeah, that's the downside, but then it starts to become more interesting from a design perspective. Okay, so this is Manitoba Hydro, which is a utility company in Canada. 
It's in the province of Manitoba. And uh, they hired a team. They selected the architect and the architect, the design architect, the architect of record, MEP. We were called energy engineers, everybody independently. And uh, expected to the team to design their new headquarter. Like there was no design competition up front. But they called this the IDP 2010 process or 20, 20, IDP 2000. IDP stands for Integrated Design uh, Process. So it was really a formula of how we have to approach design, which was sometimes a little uh, too strict, but it was quite interesting because they really expected the design team to work on different approaches. Like usually, like in 99% of all projects we work on, you get in and you have a preconceived, preconceived opinion about the project, about the building, what it's going to be. This was not allowed in this case. So this is the final building we ended up with, uh, but how we got there was quite interesting, was quite an intense process. So first we analyzed the climate, and uh, what we found is it's getting minus 35 degrees cold in winter. They get temperatures below minus 10, minus 20 over a period of two, uh, two to three months. Anna, you are, you are not from Winnipeg, yeah? No. Uh, it's cold. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just you have to be careful what you say if there's somebody from Winnipeg. <laughs> so when we, when we applied for this, I mentioned it to a friend from Toronto, and he said, what? You want to do a building in Winterpeg? <laughs> you are not allowed to use this term in Winnipeg. Never say Winterpeg in Winnipeg. I said it once in a presentation <laughs> as a joke, and it was dead silent. <laughs> and then fortunately, Bruce was there as well. Like He was the architect. And Bruce said, oh, ha, ha, winter pack. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, everybody was looking at him. <laughs> uh, OK. So, it's getting, and then they have almost half the year, they have temperatures below freezing. And then in summer, it's getting plus 35 degrees warm and humid. And then they get mosquitoes and they have black flies. Like, uh, like when, the, when the snow is gone, they get the black flies. When the black flies are gone, they get the mosquitoes. When the mosquitoes are gone, the winter is coming back. <laughs> <laughs> this is basically the situation. But it's a very lovely place, super nice people. And uh, like we look, also looked at the windrows, it's in the prairie, they have really strong winds, mainly coming from the north, but also from the south. Like you see here, they have this very strong wind coming from the south. And then when we talked to the people, they always said it's very cold here, but whenever it's really cold, it's always sunny. So we started to look at so how much solar radiation do they have. And they have more solar radiation on a horizontal surface than the city of Milan in Italy. Uh, so it's like, this is an amazing. And then we looked at how much solar radiation do we get on a vertical south facade and looked at it monthly. And here you see the monthly distribution and the blue one, the blue bar is Winnipeg. And you see actually the maximum in March when it's still minus 10 degrees or something. And the yellow one, the red one represents Toronto because we always consider Toronto, Toronto as the cl mildest climate in Canada. But you see here, significantly more sun than Toronto. And then we looked at the yellow, what would be the, the maximum conceivable if there would be no clouds all month? And you see there are months when they get more than two thirds of the maximum uh, achievable there. So it's, we said, so this is really the, the benefit of the place. This is really the quality of the place. And said, so like, if you want to do a building with passive solar design, it's, it's in Winnipeg. But this is how it looks like uh, in Winnipeg. If you throw uh, boiling water into the air, it's freezing instantaneously. What was interesting, the, the, the client came up with five goals for this building. And he said the first goal is it has to be a healthy and productive workplace environment because we do this for our people. Then the second is <clears throat> it has to be at least 60% more energy efficient than minimum code requirement in Canada. 60% was simply because they couldn't find a single building in North America which achieved 60% at the time. And I said, we want to have the best. So 
therefore 60%. Then the third was uh, signature architecture. The fourth was lead, they said at least lead gold. We also want to have like a sustainability goal. And then the fifth was the most compli complicated one because they said everything needs to be within budget. But they didn't tell us what the budget is, <laughs> at least not seriously. So what became, because it was a building for them uh, and the total money was not the real problem because at the same time they designed a new dam, like a hydro dam for $4 billion at the same time when we worked on this. And this was about 200 million for a while. Uh, finally, I think it ended up at almost 300. But when we worked on this, people came from Hydro and said, 200 million, that's like one change order we get from our dams. Right. This is like, just to put, put the number into perspective. The question is just like as a crown corporation, this is 100% owned by the province. What is acceptable, what, what is justifiable in front of the public? So like we have this big debate now with the bishop in Germany <laughs> of his residence for 30 million bucks <laughs> for himself. Like you can't do something like this. So what is justifiable? So that was a big question. And what is long-term economical for the company? So we started to do some research, research to look at productivity and we, find these, we found these charts which are actually published now on the uh, USGBC website. And it's from a report which is called uh, Benefits of Green Building Design or something like this. And they really did uh, case studies and looked at what had an impact on the productivity of people and productivity being an indicator for well-being. And out of this, we were reading that there are three issues that are very important. The one is uh, individual control over your own environment. Uh, and especially in terms of air quality, which was this building, which suddenly exceeded the scale, where you see like one, two, three, all of these buildings which have individual temperature control, and then this one all of a sudden goes up to 11% productivity control. And we said this is nothing else than our old-fashioned operable window. Like if you give people operable window, they have control over their air quality. If they feel like I need more fresh air now, they can open a window. And then here, this entire chart was at the different scale, whereas this is one, two, three, it is 10, 20, 30. And this is all about the quality of light. It's all about daylight and the quality of artificial light. So we said, okay, these are the issues which are most important. And if we can do this, then we could increase productivity. And they started to use an increase in productivity in their economic balance. So in their cost calculation. But coming back to the design, so we started to work as a team on, on all these different types of design, like low-rise atrium building, uh, high-rise small bar, and then for whatever reason, like all these different designs were tested for, we tested them for energy, for uh, wind and shading in the surrounding. The architect tested them for urban, like for program, do they fit the program? What is the urban setting? Does it work from an urbanistic perspective? The cost consultant did a cost calculation for all of them. So all of them were tested. And like most of them, like all of them, those and those were deleted because the flow plate was too deep and not enough people had good, good daylight conditions. So at the end, with all these testing, we ended up with those three and out of those three, this one became the winner. Not because it was super more efficient everywhere. But for everything we looked at, it was slightly better than the others. So we ended up with this floor plate where we have like this bar. It's basically a twin tower. And the one bar is facing east and the other bar is facing west. And this shape works really well within the setting of the property because this diagonal is basically a public connection from these bridges that you see sometimes in downtown Canadian cities, which connect downtown buildings. You've never seen it. I think Montreal has bridges. Some, some cities have tunnels. Montreal is underground. Uh, underground. Calgary has underground. Yeah. They also have these bridges. 
And those, so those bridges connect downtown buildings so that people at minus 30 degrees don't need to go outside. So this bridge connects basically here at this corner. And then people go down and there's a public pathway under this building and they get out here where all the major bus stops of downtown Winnipeg are. So it starts to become logic in the movement of people to have this diagonal, it fitted well. And what it does for us, it created this due south facing atria, which we could use basically as a solar collector for the building. So this is a section through the building and it has a three story podium and it has these six story south facing atria, again, which we use for preheating of the fresh air. So air enters the space in, this, in winter in this atria and we heat it to 10 degrees. So then when the sun comes out, it further heats it up. And then we take it from there, we distribute it through the raised floor into the depth of the floor plate. We exhaust it in this chimney and we have a heat recovery, transfer it, the heat from the exhaust to water pipes to bring it back to the supplier units. So the heat goes back here to, to the supplier unit. And then as soon as we don't need heat recovery, we exhaust naturally by this solar chimney. And then on top we have almost 300 boreholes under the building, each one going 120 meters deep to create a geothermal heat exchange. The ground temperature in Winnipeg is three degrees. So we provide 100% cooling for the building and about 50% of the heating through a heat pump. So this is it basically. This is the winter garden and the podium. In the meantime, they even use for yoga classes but this is the six story winter garden from the tower, one of the three. And we put in interconnecting stairs, people can meet them, became a real gathering space. There's a water feature inside which provides humidification in winter. And under those benches are the supply air units. So air comes in here, preheated by, to 10 degrees. And then we take the air from the winter garden through, through units which are behind these panels and push it into the raised floor plenum. There's no horizontal ductwork, there's no horizontal distribution. It's just the raised floor. And what's interesting, this is basically the mechanical room of the building. This is it, like uh, this is the fresh air system as a whole. Like there is a, there is a boiler plant room on the roof. There is a geothermal and electrical and low and telephone and tele, telecommunication, et cetera, in the basement. But from a mechanical perspective, this is the mechanical room. So this is where we collect all the exhaust air from the building and here through this grill, which is like three stories tall. It's going into the solar chimney. And here you see the grass roof of the podium. Here you see the bridge where it connects. And like it's going here in this building and here into, into our building. And then to the east and to the west, in order to make this work, we certainly needed to have uh, an external shading device. So what we have is, again, we do have a double facade, but here we have the insulated facade to the outside, which we would never do here in Europe. And it's due to the cold climate. And then we have to the inside, like this is a very typical double glazed state of the art curtain wall. And this is a single glass partition wall with the shade in between. It's not, a, it's not this fabric shade, it's not this blind, it's a Venetian blind like this one, which is running in between. But the reason why this needs, like in, in Europe, we would have the insulated glazing here, and then this single glass so that in summer, we don't get as much heat into the space. But what it would happen in this cold climate when it's minus 30 outside, somebody opens the window, the outer window pane would have a temperature of minus 20 degrees. You would get the humid air from inside onto this outer pane and it would frost right away instantaneously. Like it would be frosted. And then the frost would go when the sun next time hits the glass. If, if it's a north window, it would stay for the rest of the winter. <laughs> So if you don't like somebody, you could always open his window <laughs> and the few would be gone for this day. <laughs> so, you know, and then all the cold bridges you would deal with would not work. Like in this cold climate, it was really important to have a system that basically works without cold bridges. So this is why the insulated 
facade runs here at this layer, and which makes the uh, efforts at the inner facade really low. But in order to avoid that, like this space is getting hard. We get temperatures, if it's 35 degrees outside, we get temperatures of 40 degrees in here. And like you want to avoid that you radiate all the space to the inside. So what we did on the inside of this single glazing, we put a low E coating. So the low E avoids that we get all the radiation from the glass. The, uh, now I started to open the uh, uh, big, like we love to use low E coating here at Transola, first of all, it's like, <laughs> It's like the magic world. Uh, now what it does, like every, every, every metal surface has uh, the physical property that if it's, heat, if it's hot, it doesn't emit the heat. So like the, the emission factor is basically the factor that tells you to what percentage you emit heat by radiative heat exchange. And the lower the emissivity, the higher is the reflectivity. So if you would have a, a emissivity of zero, your reflectivity would be one, which means that it, it would be a mirror for long wave radiation. So it would all long wave radiation would be mirrored back into the space. Now, you can't achieve zero, but you can achieve on a glass, you can achieve, if it's exposed, you can achieve 0.1. Means to, by 90%, it's, it's, it's a mirror for long wave, so the temperature, if you look at it with an infrared camera, you see the temperature of your surrounding surfaces inside. It would give you a wrong temperature if you look at it with an infrared camera. I think the easiest, if you look at our blog, uh, the New York office did a very nice movie explaining low E coding and what it does. And it's like a two minute, three minute video. It's really nicely explained. Uh, okay. So, but then what's important, we do have piping in, this, in the concrete slab, like one inch water tubes running in the concrete slab. And in summer, we run cold water from the geothermal system through these pipes at 18 degrees to keep the space cool. And in winter, we run slightly heated water, maybe at 28 degrees through the pipes to keep the space warm. to try to do a kind of very sustainable building and you ended up with a fully clay sky looking like international style Percy. There was a, there's on, still ongoing, like, <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, a, I, to, throughout the design process, it was actually not that hard of a topic, to be honest. Like uh, Hydro always liked it, the architects obviously liked it. Uh, Alex did the modeling and he compared it, the 100% fenestration ratio to a 60% fenestration ratio. And we basically came to the same result in terms of energy performance. To be fully honest, it was even a little worse with 60% fenestration ratio. And the answer was quite simple. Like uh, with the double facade, we achieved such a good U value that the additional losses we make up by the passive solar gains for the space. And in summer, we don't have a problem because of the shade. So we don't have the heat gains in summer. So in this particular climate, it was really that the passive solar gains was really making up for the additional losses. So, <clears throat> but, but it's still like an ongoing debate, like even to the extent I was driving to the building in a cab with Bruce and some more people from KPMB. And Bruce sitting in the front, like the architect, he said to the cab driver, how do you like this building? He said, ah, oh, it's kind of nice, but uh, they always tell us it's the most energy efficient building in the whole North America. How can it be so energy efficient with all this glass? <laughs> like was the perception of the cab driver. <laughs> so it, it, it started a long debate in, uh, in the whole of Canada. Like, is gla are glass buildings all of a sudden acceptable? And I always said, like, it's not black and white, like always. It's acceptable if you have a double facade, if you have the excellent shade, if you have the state-of-the-art curtain wall, like if you do all of this, then all of a sudden you get to a tipping point where you can do an all-glass building, in this climate in particular. Okay, 
So this is what it is. And then we had a long debate whether 26 degrees uh, air temperature in the space is acceptable. And we looked at operative temperature, and they said we want to have, we are sustainable here. We don't want to have 22, but we want to have 24. This is how they run their typical buildings. And then we, we did this very simple comparison, showed them that if they have an internal shade, which is what they usually have, that heats up to 40 degrees, the temperature this person feels is actually close to 26. Whereas in our system, where we have 40 degrees in the double facade, an inside surface temperature of 32, a space temperature of 26, but then a, like the chilled ceiling and the radiant cooling coming from the ceiling, the overall operative temperature is even better. And which was uh, this very simple diagram was actually good enough to convince the client of going ahead with 26, which was important for us because with the radiant system, we would not be able to achieve 24. So this would have killed the whole system. They come back and say, we want to have 24 as a design temperature. OK, what does it mean in terms of energy? This is a little unfair comparison, because in those, you also have plug loads, whereas in those, uh, you don't have the plug loads. Uh, it's kind of unfair. But anyway, like these are the numbers for all Canadian commercial buildings, the new Canadian commercial buildings, all, uh, let's say, uh, close to 500 kilowatt hours per square meter in a year. You can take plug loads out. Plug loads are somewhere at 20, 30 kilowatt hours per square meter in a year. It doesn't make that big of a difference. This was required based on uh, Canadian code at the time when we designed this. And there was an incentive program uh, that would have brought you to here. And this was the design of the building, what we have modeled in the design process. And this is what we have monitored over a period of two years. So over a period of two years, we gave the designer, we have access to their building management system from here. So we can always look at all operating data, give them advice. And then like what this chart shows, it shows the consumption for the past year, yeah, every month. Like this was October, November, uh, September 2010, October 2010, always the past year looking at every month. We had some issue with the geothermal system, which they fixed here, what you can see. But then after two years, we, sl we started to exceed uh, the, the predicted number. So what it shows us, like uh, whatever we predicted, we had always achieved if we had the chance to monitor a building and give design advice. But a building doesn't just work. I think if, they, if you, people start to operate a building, it's always in a range of twice the energy consumption. So what did you optimize? I think it started with the lighting controls were wrong, the temperature controls. I think you would need to talk to Alex. He'll give you much more detail about it. But every sensor is about one degree off. So it turns on a system too early or too late. You know, you need to go all, and most is scheduled. When a building is getting occupied, usually it's not fully finished. So what facility managers do, they turn on all system full speed to give people first comfortable conditions so that they don't get too many complaints in the beginning. And I would say 80% of the buildings continue to operate like this over centuries, <laughs> sometimes. Uh, and I'm, I'm really, I'm also like fish, Norbert Fisch, here, EGS professor in Braunschweig, he did this study which was called EVA, EVA, evaluation, whatever. <laughs> but they looked at 25, 30 buildings, 40 buildings maybe, how much energy they consume and what was the prediction. And they figured out they're all like between 50 and 100% off. And I discussed it once with him and I said, did you ever look at, and these were all buildings like this like the Norddeutsche Landesbank was one of our buildings which was in the study, said, did you ever look at very conventional buildings, like without ambitions? And I said, no, we never looked at those. But I'm pretty sure they are also off. Uh, I think it's just the nature of how construction business is messed up. Okay, so, but I think what's also important and something we talk about later again is what does a building do to the outdoor environment? 
because we we, are, we pretty much got into this question of outdoor comfort, pedestrian comfort over the past couple of years. And uh, here we did some CFD modeling also early in the process to look at what happens if not only the south sun hits the building, but also the south wind hits the building. And when wind hits a building, it, also, it always goes like in all directions around this building. And you have always a component which is going down. And by the way, Nadia, we also tested very aerodynamic shaped buildings. We never ever got rid of this component which is going down. I'm, since then, I'm absolutely convinced that you could always, all, only get rid of this if the building is as thin as an aircraft wing. An aircraft wing has only two dimensions where the wind is going, no third dimension. But you would need to get this <laughs> thickness to avoid this third dimension. But I think a building is always, like the volume of a building is always so big that you, can't, you, you, can, you can minimize it, but you, I think you can never get rid of it. I've actually seen a, in a competition a design of a building that had exactly the shape of a... Aircraft wing. An aircraft wing, yeah. And the architects, they were actually concerned that uh, there would be so much suction that it would just, you know, <laughs> pull, the play, uh, pull, the, pull the building to the side. So. <laughs> No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but then it doesn't doesn't it, does it still work for people to get into the building? Like if it's <laughs> how much useless space do you build if you make a building so thin? Before you compromise the program, isn't it easier to create it like a wind barrier like this canopy? Uh, but I think the important lesson of this was, uh, as designers, we do have a responsibility to also look at the environment and the surrounding of our buildings. And wind is certainly one issue, shading is the other issue. And you see here, this is Air Canada Plaza. And I think uh, this is, I think it was 1st of May, this image. And you show one of the competing designs still shaded Air Canada Plaza 1st of May whereas this building does not shade, basically does not shade uh, Air Canada Plaza. And that was a big design goal. And to be honest, until we had this, the board, the board of the company always wanted to have this tower because this was less energy efficient, but it was the tallest tower in Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. And they have all these design goals, but when this, the decision is being made, things like this sudden, all of a sudden start to become important. And it was finally, it was the, this issue of shading Air Canada Plaza, where, which convinced the board that we should not proceed with this design. So here are some images. This is the canopy that deals with this wind, with this downdraft. And then that's something very important, like they were forced by the uh, mayor of Winnipeg to put the headquarter of, for 2,000 people into the downtown environment. It was a part of, a, revitalization downtown Winnipeg, like this kind of dying prairie, mid-sized prairie city. And what they did is they said like every business we find in the surrounding of three blocks, we don't put in our building. So they don't have staff cafeteria in the building. People have to go out into the restaurants to get food or cook by themselves. They don't put a gym into their building. They don't put a, a childcare facility. They always looked around and said, what do we find? And we don't compete against downtown businesses. So as a consequence, they also didn't put in parking. There's no parking in the building, except for the board. <laughs> but what you see is like they made this comparison to their suburb offices. They still have offices in the suburbs where they have all parking for all employees, and you see only 10% in their suburb suburban offices are coming by public transportation or carpools or by bike. Whereas now in the new downtown headquarter, 84% are all of a sudden coming by carpools. They, st they still have parking facilities, so people could still come with their cars, not in the building, like private parking facilities, they would pay for their parking. But now 84% are doing carpool and cycling or public transportation. I think this is an amazing difference. And then they also looked at sick days and they s compared it also to the suburban office and the number of sick days reduced by 1.25 days per employee. 
Uh, so we did a rough calculation. The energy savings for the buildings for the building is around seven hundred fifty thousand dollars per year. These one point two five days is equal to two million dollars per year. Yeah. It's really amazing. Not talking about people being more productive uh, because they are working in a much better environment. Uh, just the fact that they are less sick. So here, this is the solar chimney. So in order, again, to give them the tallest building, we extended the solar chimney <laughs> quite a bit. Like physically, something like this would have been sufficient. <laughs> but the architect really liked it to have it very tall. OK, so this is, this is Winnipeg. Let me jump over KFW. I think we spent a lot, a lot of time on Manitoba Hydro. Let me talk about this building. I think it's the pure opposite. It's a French school. We worked with Atelier Lyon uh, from, uh, from Paris. The, it's the French school in Damascus. And the idea was, or the question was, could we do a building there, a school, without air conditioning? A low budget, it had to be low budget. The whole building was paid by the parents' association. The French government paid for the land. They also paid our fees, but they didn't pay for the construction. So it was a, a requirement to make this really low budget. And it was actually the parents who came first and said, would it be possible to do a building without air conditioning? Because like, these are all European families putting their kids there. And they said, like, they felt like air conditioning is making our kids sick. That was their take, which is probably true because, like, in the, the air conditioning systems we saw there, like, maintenance is something very, <laughs> very different What our consideration of maintenance. So we looked at the climate data. We found that it's super hot. Obviously, in Damascus, they have temperatures of 40 degrees in summer every day. And, but it, it always cools down at nighttime. It's dry. It's a real desert climate. It cools down to at least 20 degrees or even colder at nighttime. So we said, okay, this is the potential, like thermal mass, cooling at nighttime. So we ended up with a scheme where we have those solar chimneys. And what they do, they are facing west so that they get the low sun angles in the afternoon. Like in, if you face it south, midday, sun is basically vertical, and like you have no solar gains or just diffuse. So we're facing them west, and then the, the back wall is a masonry wall painted black. So if the sun hits the wall, it heats up the wall. The wall stays hard overnight to keep this natural ventilation going. And then we created these courtyards with the vegetation, the shading devices. And then air here, Matze was there, did some measuring, some measurements. Temperature here is three, four degrees lower already than it is over here. So these courtyards have already a significant impact. And then we take the air from the courtyards and we draw it through pipes, which are in the ground slab. And then they enter the space and they exhaust by the solar chimney. And there are more pipes which are ducted to the space above and again driven by the solar chimney. There's no fan. There is no motorized damper. There are dampers inside the space at the solar chimney. The kids, they have to operate those dampers. If they don't operate, there is no function. Uh, it's nothing. There's no control system, nothing. Even those shades are not motorized. They pull it over in April, and they stay there until the end of September. And then they open it again. For, for the solar chimney to work, has like the sun to hit the glazing part of it. Yeah. But the school schedule, like I'm thinking, it starts like early in the day. So why not the glazing facing the east, where the sun is rising, for the solar chimney to heat the space and then to be working for the schedule for the kids? So that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a complaint I also hear heard here in the office. No, I think there are two scenarios. Like the one is, what is the priority? getting ventilation when the kids are in the space or maximizing ventilation at nighttime. Because like in this scenario where you get the, the west sun late afternoon, like four afternoon onwards, you really heat up this wall to something like 50 degrees. And this hard wall keeps the natural flow at nighttime going so that you cool down the thermal mass at nighttime 
And we saw in our modeling that we compromised the ventilation during day because then in the morning, the, the wall is cooled down from the nighttime air and there's still no sun on the chimney. But our take was people can still tilt the window so they still get fresh air. They depend more on the nighttime cooling than on the daytime ventilation. So if the nighttime cooling is not there, the space just overheats. Yeah. And the temperature, like, uh, at night it's cooling down, and it wouldn't be this sufficient for the table mass to cool down, or because, like you said, it's getting 20 at night. So this wouldn't, wouldn't be this, like, enough for the table mass to, to radiate all its heat that the gave through the day? Yeah, but you need in, to have enough air change rates. Oh. Like, if without the chimney, if you would have just single side ventilation, if you tilt your windows, this would not be enough. Would give you maybe two air change rates. If the, with the chimney, we get four or five air change rates. Plus, we have this, let's call it the extended thermal mass in the ground slab. Uh, whereas usually the ground slab is more or less disconnected thermally from the space because of the, uh, of the uh, floor finish. The floor finish and then sometimes insulation. Here we insulate always our ground slabs. And so the, the thermal mass you basically have would be the ceiling only. And so with this duct in the ground slab, we connected thermally the ground slab as a thermal mass to the space. So it, it, it just, let's say the single side ventilation would be the simple version. The chimney creates more heat exchange, more air change rates, more cooling. The ground slab adds more cooling uh, because of the additional thermal mass. So step by step, we made it better. And even, even in the optimized systems, we showed them through our modeling that at the end of a two week hot period, they get at the end of the day, they get more than about 30 degrees inside. But then the parents said, okay, if we have 40, 45 outside, 30 is good and it's acceptable. Uh, and we had some issues, like Matze was there to do some monitoring. I think you're gonna meet Matze maybe tonight. You should talk to him about the issues we have there. <laughs> but uh, the funny thing is we have a couple, or um, let's say, I would say probably 60, 70% of all spaces work perfectly fine. So this was our proof that we say, if it works fine there, the physics in this space is the same than the physics in this space. What we had, the biggest issue was concrete running into our ducts, which are in the ground slab. So therefore, many spaces do not have sufficient air change rates during the night and don't cool down sufficiently. So anyway, they like it to the extent that before the Civil War, they wanted to extend the school with the same concept. So. I was wondering why, why the ceiling is at this uh, different yeah. angle. This one? Uh, yeah. What do you mean with different, why it's tilted? I mean, it's not like a straight, uh, normal thing. Yeah, just to, if it's raining, just to drain the that's water. That's what the rain, that, that's, that's it. That's it, and then this is like, this, they do these double ceilings. Uh -huh. They extend the second ceiling so that the heat from the sun, they dissipate by the natural ventilation that happens between. Instead of insulating the ceiling, this is a very common technique. What happens in Damascus, they have instead like pine leaves on top of the buildings. Like it acts like uh, shading for the rooftop. Yeah. Okay. It's a vernacular. Uh, yeah. Uh, they use pine leaves. Pine leaves, yeah, on the okay. tents or uh, vines on the okay. top of the roof. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just to create this uh, air tunnel between the rooftop and uh, the canopy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the solar gains you get through the roof into your space is the biggest problem, the biggest burden, in in such a climate. So this is the building at nighttime. It, it actually looks perfect in these pictures. I was a very good photographer. <laughs> I saw the building by myself. <laughs> it's, uh, the execution is not as perfect as it looks like here, but still a beautiful building. And it's very simple and construction costs had been, translated had been $500 a square meter uh, instead of a school here costing almost $2,000 a square meter. Is it preserved through the war? Do you know, recent progress, was it uh, damaged? Or? No, the, like the last message I had was that it's still functioning, but this is already 
this is already five months old or six months old. This I'm not sure what happened now. What's a can't see in this image, but there is a mountain here to the left. Ah, and Assad, he has his yeah, building. Yeah, yeah. So if the Americans would start to shoot the Assad, I'm not sure if the building would survive. <laughs> he is basically looking down onto this. Yeah. On one, I think he has more than one. Yeah. I think they talked about five or something. I confirmed. Yeah. Let me jump over this as well. I think, so the question, should we do, uh, no, I think we do another 15 minutes and then we go for a beer probably. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think w when, you, uh, when you look at what, or when you follow what's happened in terms of energy efficiency in building design and code requirements we have for building in Germany, over the past, I would say, almost 20 years now, like in 95, we got the first really uh, demanding code requirement on energy. Uh, you think, let's say, there must be a big difference already, like carbon emissions must have gone down significantly. This, is, this image shows the carbon emissions, the blue line for, this, for our city of Stuttgart here, and what happened, and the red line, if we would follow the European Union carbon roadmap. So what you see is basically it's nothing happens, nothing. Because there are a couple of boomerang effects that the buildings itself, on average, they became more efficient, but then we have more buildings because the per person demand is growing, etc. So there's a lot of things that eat up everything we have achieved so far. So I like this image I got from, from a friend, structure engineer for, here from Stuttgart, Knippers Helbig where he showed a Mercedes from 36 accelerating to 100 kilometers per hour in 83 seconds. But this is how the highway looked like at the time. So this is the Tesla accelerating in 3.7 seconds to 100, but this is how the highway looks today. So, so we become efficient, but we are not effective with what we are doing. And I think this is, we need to think br broader and within, we need to think think on a different scale to fully understand the dynamics and how we can become more effective. And this is from another friend, Thomas Stark. Matze always claims that the numbers are not correct, but I think they are good enough. He started to compare the personalized balance of various people. And he said, Mr. Müller, a very typical German name, he lives in with two people on 200 square meter house, built as based on minimum code requirements, NF, is the energy code we have in Germany, but he's running his middle class car, a C-Class. C-Class is a Mercedes, like when you do comparison like this in Stuttgart, we always, you always have to use Mercedes as a, <laughs> as a basis. <laughs> so, you know, Mercedes is manufacturing here in Stuttgart. And he's commuting for 15 kilometers every day to work. Then his piece of the house, basically 50% of the energy consumption of the house, and his C-Class, add up to this personal balance. So this is the heating, this is power he needs in the house for the dishwasher, the washing machine, computer, TV, etc. And this is the gray is commuting. Then he, he looked at Mr. Meyer, this is Helmut. <laughs> <laughs> he lives on a 160 square meter passive house. So it's the house is smaller, he lives in this house with four people and he has the most, uh, the most um, ambitious energy code. But he has an SUV, has his M-Class, Helmut, <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's commuting 30 kilometers every day to work. So all of a sudden this is his personalized balance. So the building itself becomes negligible and his personal balance is driven by commuting with his car. And now comes Mr. Schmidt, who is living in an old flat in Stuttgart West on 130 square meters by himself, like a hundred year old. <laughs> Pretty good, yeah, like, this is Josh. Where's Josh? <laughs> 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 Not quite 130. <laughs> Not quite, but getting close to. Nah. And he's cycling two, two kilometers every day to work. <laughs> yeah, it's Josh. <laughs> he would cycle 10 kilometers, yeah, yeah. We, we always call him the green teacher here because 
not Josh, the Mr. Schmidt. <laughs> so this is his balance. Uh, it's all driven by the fact that he's living in an, in an old building, 100 years old, not renovated, big heating demand. So I think what this tells us, we have to be more holistic on how we look at our overall energy cons consumption and look more holistically on personalized balances than looking on just kilowatt hours per square meter in a year. What does it tell us, kilowatt hours per square meter in a year? If nobody is using the building, like, what, what does it mean? It, it's basically meaningless. Let me jump over this. I, okay, maybe shortly. And then there's another which ties into this, this question of density. And there was this graph which was developed, I think, in the 70s already. I forgot the name who published it first. But it shows the energy consumption required for transportation in cities depending on the density, how many people live per hectare. And you see here all these North American cities, like low density, all these widespread cities, and how much energy they consume. And then you see here the European cities, and then here the East, Far East cities, like Hong Kong here with the highest density. But this is like this exponential relationship where, if you want, the European cities achieve the optimum because they reach this elbow when it starts to become, like if you double the density here from Munich, if you double it, you get only 20% better. Yeah. Level of but I've tried it for Cairo. Yeah. Because Cairo has a much more higher density than Hong Kong. I think mm -hmm. triple or four times like Hong Kong. But when I tried to do that thing with a transportation engineer, a friend of mine, actually it was much higher. It was something like Sydney. Yeah, it's going so up one, again. Like, like it has like eight or seven times the density of Sydney because of the uh, what that uh, rush hours, like the people spend for like ten or few hours every day just. Uh, <coughs> Uh, like burning gas for nothing, for just being for just standing, place. and also the urban heat island effect puts much pressure also in the uh, oh, in yeah. the uh, it, it raises the, air, the temperature air of the city, of yeah. the whole city. Mm -hmm. As many, too many other things going on, so I, I guess it, it it's an interesting point, observation. It, it, it's a bit going like back. And, so you I, think Europe? We should stick I to the density <laughs> of Europe. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, but I think, let's say, the message, whether, let's say, whether there are uncertainties, the message is pretty clear that if you lower, if you increase the density, distances to your destinations are getting smaller because people usually have always have the same destinations. They commute to work, they go to a bar to meet people, they go to the sports, and if the distance is big, they use a lot of energy for transportation. If the distance is small, they're using less there might be effects where it starts to flip, but I think that's a general uh, result of this. So let's say getting back to this question here, I think instead of only looking at buildings, we also need to look at how can we create cities that require less, less uh, commuting. So we did this competition 2006, 2007, with Banish architects, and we also had Gale architects involved. Has, has anybody ever heard of Gale architects? No? It's a, uh, you know them? No? Uh, okay. They're urban planners in Denmark. Denmark. Not really urban planners. They call themselves architects, but they don't do architecture nor planning. Uh, they're basically consultants for livable cities, I would call it. Uh, like they did, they, they were consulting the city of New York with all the uh, with all the cycling lanes and the pedestrian area at Times Square, so things like this. Young Gale was teaching in Toronto in the 70s, 80s, and is still very popular in Toronto. Uh, when he's very popular in general, in general, in general yeah. Uh, and it's really interesting company, and was was a lot of fun to work with them on this. But what was interesting, it was downtown Pittsburgh was a, com a competition basically set up by the city of Pittsburgh. And they had these, let's say, four parcels downtown with buildings that can go down or parking structures, but let's say heavily underutilized piece of land. Right at the river, like here's the river. And Pittsburgh is in a triangle between two rivers. And this triangle is called the Golden Triangle. 
and which is downtown Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh is a city the size of Stuttgart, 600,000 people. There are only 3,000 3, people living in the Golden Triangle. There's almost nobody living anymore downtown Pittsburgh. So the intent of the city was, first of all, to utilize the, this piece of land downtown, but also to get as many people downtown as possible, to create a vibrant district with as many people living there as possible. So the task for us was pretty clear to basically how can we maximize density and still create a high quality environment, a high quality district. So that was the idea. And like these are all images from Gale. It's like how can we basically entertain the public realm because to get people into the public realm. They have these very simple rules where they say people go where people are. So you need to have a critical mass of people in the public realm to draw more people into the public realm. Like if it's dead, like Jan Gale always says, there are two indicators for a livable city. The one is how many people do you find in the public, public realm? How many people use the bike? That's it. So like these are the two indicators that tells you what a livable city is. So these were all suggestions Gale made. And then like after a pretty long competition design process, We ended up with this massing scheme where here is the river, and then we said this is going to be a pedestrian street, 8th Street, which we want to attract so that we draw people towards the riverfront. And let me jump a little faster over this. The problem is that right now they have a big highway running along the river here. And the design proposal was that instead of having the highway here, we bridge the highway And then we have these stairs where people can hang out and watch a floating stage where they can have performances going on to really attract people to go to the river. So that was the design idea. And then on top of it, you see these weird combination of streets and lanes. They have, when we analyze the climate, they have these nice breeze going east-west, but they have really strong cold winds. Uh, North-south is the summer breeze, but this cold wind is going, coming along the river, going east-west or west-east. So there was a hierarchy of lanes that we had smaller lanes facing west, facing the west side with, with these offsets so that the cold wind coming can't go through the, through the, city, the city fabric so that the city fabric itself starts to block the wind, but then also creating these small pockets which are exposed to the sun at different times of day. So we did some, this, is, this was a rendering Benestedt for 8th Street. We did a shading study where we looked at the whole development from sun position. And like this is 21st of March or 21st of September. Early morning, this is something like 9 o'clock in the morning. And here you see in white, this, is, this was the massing proposal. And you see like, 10 o'clock in the morning, 11 o'clock, we have already, like, this is 10 o'clock. Oh, sorry, this was wrong. Going back. Now everybody's confused. <laughs> so this was 10 o'clock. So we have so sun here, we have sun here. And then 11 o'clock, this starts to open up. And then 12 o'clock noon, we have sun in, in, in 8th Street, so that restaurant could have their tables sitting on 8th Street. And then in the afternoon, It's different pockets which start to open up towards the sun. And then like here, and then late afternoon, we get sun onto the riverfront. So what was interesting, we were really sitting with the architects and having this styrofoam massing and started to shift them and really creating this, let's say, distinguish height so that we have always moments when sun penetrates through, through the massing onto certain areas. And since then, I'm really convinced that this, that a uniform height, especially like the burn-in block, which is fully enclosed, creates much more environmental problems in the courtyard than if you start to distinguish the height and you open it up. So like if you compare it to the Stuttgart, like the Berlin block to the Stuttgart West block, in the Stuttgart West, all buildings are disconnected. And you always have these moments when lights fall into the courtyard and you also get a breeze going through the courtyard creating a much nicer courtyard environment than the fully enclosed blocks. 
OK, so this was a final rendering. And wonder if we should keep it here. I think it's good. Huh? With this? This is finished. This is it. I have not more to show. We did some proposals on infrastructure, uh, but this is not, was not so essential. I think what was really essential to us is how can we optimize quality of the outdoor environment in this case, while at the same time maximizing massing that goes. We actually won this competition. We are still working uh, on it to make it a project. Now what happened is then they started to negotiate with the developer who was involved. And all, all of a sudden, there was 2008, and it was the housing crisis. And this was all, like, the financial proposal was that this is all getting paid by the, by the condos they're going to build. So this whole economical proposal collapsed. So right now, things ramp up again. And in, in Pittsburgh, they still talk about it. Every time someone gets to Pittsburgh, people say we are still excited about it. We still hope it's going to happen at some point. <laughs> but uh, if projects do not happen for such a long period, it's very unlikely that they come back. OK, I, I think we, I have a little bit about outdoor comfort, but we're not going to do this today. I think it's good. So last questions. So then let me give a final word. I think it just I think the idea was to really give you a, a little bit of an idea of how we think, how we want to approach things. But I think you got a sense of that we think that it's very important not only consider energy efficiency. I think in terms of energy efficiency, we need to be much more innovative, much more radical. Uh, we need to progress much faster. But at the same time, I think we do, we do buildings for people, we do cities for people, we need to think about environmental quality. And like when we selected projects for our new booklet we are working on, we came up with a, a selection criteria. I said like TED, you know the TED conferences. And TED conference means, uh, TED means technology, entertainment, design. I said let's replace entertainment against environmental. So it needs to be good in terms of technology it needs to be good in terms of environmental quality, and it needs to be good in terms of design. I think we identify ourselves very much in the relation to the architect in this relation between engineering and design. We don't consider ourselves being designer. Like, we are engineers, we want to be engineers. Sometimes I think we are hardcore engineers. <laughs> but we love to work on this interface between engineering and design and to what extent engineering can inform the design, create better buildings. I think this is what we want. And, I ho and, and then even more better cities and thinking more on a bigger scale in order to create also become effective, not only efficient. I think this is what we think where we should proceed. So I hope I got this across and, and I'm happy to see you all for a beer pretty soon. Thank <laughs> you.